Mr. convinced me that they are the mayor of Cut Knife, Saskatchewan. I, I, I took it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> so I want you to, you know, uh, since we're in entrepreneurship, let's see if you folks know one of the basic expressions in business and in entrepreneurship. Does anybody know what that expression, caveat emptor, means? It is fun. You got it, Mr. Little Poplar. It means buyer beware. And it's, it's a disclaimer. Many businesses will have a disclaimer. Uh, I happen to be reading in the hotel room, if there's a fire, don't take anything with you, run out of the room and bring your key. And right next to it is a phrase, it is a legal uh, conditions, we are responsible for nothing that's lost in the fire. That's a disclaimer. So we got to watch the legalese language here, but that's a legal expression. Buyer beware. So I want you. I'm not for sale. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to beware. Who knows what could happen? Uh, you know, you could be you could be sucked in like I was. You were naked at the hotel or the Democrats, huh? Now folks, all last week we were very intensive. Really, we morphed into a creative writing workshop with the members of uh, Change It Up. And they they were never told who would come to talk with them. They were never told the name of the <coughs> author. They were never told the name of the book, and here's the book, The Trees Are Still Bending South. And they were never told the title of the poems. What I did instead, uh, Ms. Prue Turner, is I would take a piece of writing, and I took it from the beginning, middle, and end, and I would cut it out, I would photocopy it with Ms. Cryer, and then I would cut it out, and then they would be handed this. They would be handed one of the poems. There is no page, no title, no name of author. There is nothing. The words had to stand or fall on their own merit. And then, like new kids on the block, we went step by step through your poetry. And I'll give you an example. We'll start out, and for the first time ever, they're going to hear the poems read out loud by the poet. So, um, maybe we can begin with... Um, let's see. And did you have your own copy with you? No. So you don't mind reading from this one? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, if you would read in a strong, projected voice this poem, of which they don't even know the title. Oh, oh la la. Markers. i to be careful because I've got a lot of markers. See if you remember it, folks, as she reads it out loud. Before I read it out loud, I just want to um, thank all of you for, for being here and for inviting me and for doing the work inviting me. And I want to thank the people here so generously and carefully for the while for accepting the support.
Looking down to the window of a dream. I have a dream where I wake up laughing. Then I dream I'm able to walk on top of great white waters. Open my eyes to the stillness of snow lingering around the trunks of trees and inside rocks so far below. Grandmother Moon full still her silver light swelling in the wind. Her circular songs rewriting the sky as morning red pours out to the throat and water rose. Their lines unwinding. For each person's life is as sacred as a woman who sits at the foot of a tree, peering down through that sky. Childhood longings, broad strokes of red painted onto black and scratches, real world of color and light. Cold melodies pushed near the bed, leaving there the wind blowing, calling, calling out a story of what it is to be born between the girls, the tree and the side. The sky folds its blues around my bed, red. Looking down through the plain window, I hear the keys on the piano, fingering those tips of the ears of air. Then small scribbles of snow, the sun's reflection, like a syllabic language written in the ground, defying the blue lines and poles around the land where the wind and the ice sends messages skyward. More water, more ice, words refracted for the birds to read, to the star people, and in the spring light, the snow around the trees accentuates their greens and cold and autumn. And as the plain descends, I know it. Us made tea, always like to live by the water. In my bones, I know why. Not just for transportation, but Do you folks remember that one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Ms. Pujer, when I said it's like new kids on the block, step by step, they received your poem. Uh, on, on that paper with no reference whatsoever, I asked them, would you please read it once, straight through, and write one word about it? Okay, so they did that. And they were all, all there at their computers. I said, now would you please read it a second time, straight through, and write a, a, a sentence about it. And a sentence is just a verb and a noun. Anything else is up to them. Subsequently, I asked them, would you please read it a third time straight through and write a paragraph about that piece of writing? And incidentally, I never called it a poem. I always referred to it as a piece of writing so that they would interpret it however they wanted. Um, and would you please write a paragraph? A paragraph is two sentences or more. Then I asked them, would you please read it a fourth time straight through and in a stream of consciousness vein, write everything that goes through your mind about the, uh, that piece of writing. Now, in actual fact, this was the last piece of writing they received. We had been doing this all week, so I figured, well, now's the time for them to try and make a mental picture of who's writing this. And, of course, James Joyce wrote a, a very... A, 
very well-known book, James Joyce, one of the, the great novelists of the 20th century, called Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. So I asked them, would you please write a portrait of the artist? How do you see the person who's writing uh, this? And I, I said, whoever wrote this. I didn't even say it was masculine, feminine, one or more people, just whoever wrote this. And I figured, you know what? Poets, uh, poets are about creativity, and that's really what the focus of our week together. It was creativity as an operative principle for entrepreneurship, for business, uh, because that's what makes business happen. Um, and I invited them to make up their own words and to give their own definition of that word. So with your permission, theirs, I'd like to share with you how the members of Change It Up engaged you without ever meeting you, but through your words. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Word for uh oh. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and in Rajit, feel free to move up for the sound, uh, whatever it will help. Well, here's here's one of the members of Change It Up. Now, incidentally, um, I, I've, I'm very jealous of their names. May I introduce you to Ms. Rattlesnake? And Mr. Yellowbird? Ms. Northwest? I mean, and, and Miss Saddleback, and so I, and Mr. Little Poplar, and I said, what am I doing with such a dull name like Cornette? Well, you could change it to Cornette. <laughs> <laughs> so since it was a matter of getting our bearings, and there was somebody in the seminar named Ms. Northwest, I said, would you please call me from now on South by Southwest? <laughs> And I invited the members of the seminar, as I've just told you. Well, here's one of the people. And I'm going to give you a sense, because you're a craftsperson of words. You're um, a wordsmith. Well, here's one of the words that a seminar member made up after reading your poem. And I'll write it for me. Because business is about coming up with your own ideas. So they invented, their word invention was to morning, and this means tomorrow morning. in the morning. Because <laughs> we want to encourage them in their businesses, in their entrepreneurship, to think new thoughts, <coughs> to come up with new ideas and new ways of expressing them, of getting them across. And that's why I felt it was important to invite you, because that's really your specialty, your expertise, how to express oneself how to get the ideas across, and how to have an impact. Well, here's a, another member of, um, of Change It Up on the same poem. And here they wrote in a stream of consciousness, in, in dialogue with you, not having yet met you. This piece is saying to me that the writer is coming home after a long while. How he dreams of laughing and the innocence of childhood. The time in his life that has long since gone. I too am brought to my own childhood and how when we moved away from grandmother I couldn't wait to see her. I couldn't wait to play in the bushes with my uncles. We were all innocent and free. Everything seemed to shine each morning. Watching my kokum cooking up a storm for the two of us, and then secretly telling me to get ready so we could go to town. Good times, just her and I. I was her baby, and I miss her. She was the one I ran to, to tell everything, everything good that happened in my life. She was the one 
I needed to tell. I no longer have anyone to share the pride in my children and grandchildren. No one to tell how happy, sad, or confused I am. She was the only one that truly loved me. And I long to be just like her. I learned everything I know from her. She was my greatest mentor. And I hope one day that one of my grandchildren feels like that about me. For the greatest thing on earth that I can become is to be just as wonderful as my Coco. I love you, Coco. This is where my thoughts are right now. Whether it makes sense or not, my Coco is home to me. So we invite you to riff on that, Ms. Pooter, and we'll open it up. Aww. <laughs> I'm, I'm an alchemist, I'm a grandma, and um, I have four grandkids, and um, my, my oh, the oldest is 15, and he um, is from my son-in-law, a previous relationship, and then um, my, my first, the first and the, the, the girl that they had together was, you know, my girl. I call her number one. And um, I have that kind of relationship with her. And um, it's funny that it almost makes me want to cry, you know, it moves me to tears because it makes me think of my relationship with my grandmother. This one, I know. My, my daughter even says, oh, Mom, I'm so jealous of your relationship with her. It's so amazing. And, um, <clears throat> so I know that I can imagine her saying that when she gets home. Her saying that. I'm a mm. It's beautiful. I mean, whoever wrote that, Unless they identify themselves, it's anonymous. It's up to them to say who wrote it. Mm -hmm. They're right there it, in front of you. It just, it just really demonstrates the power of writing. You know, um, to be able to feel all those feelings from somebody else's words. Like when I was listening to that, I felt so much. And um, how that person was reading what I wrote and then went into her or his own um, world. And then when I'm listening to their words, I'm going into my own world. And it just kind of demonstrates the power of writing, the power of story, the power of words to, um, you know how they tell us that words are sacred? And it really um, comes home about just emotionally, because it's almost like that emotions are um, where everything eventually ends up, is in emotion. Mm -hmm. Everything comes out from emotion and goes into emotion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was my <laughs> Maybe a postcard I was to it. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> well, the first lesson in this is never underestimate your potential, folks. You know, you have an award-winning writer here who has just said, whoa. Or as the trickster told me, the name of Hobima, I didn't know the origins of that word, Hobima. And I learned that this was because somebody came into this territory and their horse was running away and their horse's name was Bima and they had to tell him, Oh, Bima! <laughs> 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 
This is how I get sucked in. <laughs> and, you know, just, just listening now to this dialogue between what you've written and what one of the seminar members wrote, you know, in the Bible, and I'm a religious studies scholar, the Psalms are actually songs. And then later they were put into writing and became poems. And there's one of the Psalms that says, Deep calls unto deep at the sound of thy waters. And really what's just happened is deep has called unto deep. It's a communion of souls from the depths of their soul. Well, here's another seminar member. It's the same piece of writing. And... We sort of, what we experiment is how we can all read from the same page and every one of us interpret it differently and that's where the ideas and the riches and the wealth come from. Is from those, rather than seeing, oh, what's the right interpretation of your poem? Well, my interpretation <coughs> brings something totally new to it. And to work with my ideas, my perspective and my words, I'm bringing something new to the table which is a, a first principle of business and entrepreneurship. Well, here's another person who invented their own word. I think we're going to have to turn the page. Because I've asked them to be creative, to invent their own words. And well, where did that black pen go? Oh, thanks very much. They invert, in, invented this word, hacks. Now, we have it on the best authority that hacks means let it go, just relax. <laughs> and here, now they have no idea who's written these words. I asked them to do a portrait of the artist. Well, here's their portrait. This person is gentle and quiet. She listens to what is being said. Her imagination is unlimited, waiting to pour into the real world. Why is she waiting? What is holding her back? She wasn't ready before now. She sure is at this moment. She works with her hands and is a visual person. Her mother is like her opposite. Her mother is loud and cheerful. <clears throat> Opposites attract. Her father is similar, quiet and gentle. She grew up in a family of six kids, she being number five, so she was pampered. Her parents did everything for her. It wasn't helpful for her to go into the world on her own. She had to deal with what life has thrown at her. Now she has three kids and now has to teach them what she has learned. So you, what do you think of that? I wish I had that life. <laughs> <laughs> that has seven kids, and I'm number two, three. Five girls, two boys. Um, my dad was extremely violent, and um, so was my mom. And I actually experienced a lot of really, really, uh, I was tortured by the Canadian government. I guess she must have kind of known what was happening, and she said to me, you know, when children are asked to sacrifice so much, um, we rewarded tenfold. And we 
now in my life, I really think that, that it's true. And I think there's a reason why some of us come on this earth to really go through really rough times as true. And um, even when we like when we don't even make it. And we're not but we don't I don't know the reason, but I know there's a I never started writing or publishing or writing until I was 40. Wow, that's amazing. Because it's a tough, you, you, all of us have got tough rows to hope. Trying to break into the writing business. I'm telling you, I deal with a lot of them. It ain't easy. <coughs> so this is quite remarkable to break into the business at that age. I need to. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I, was, I went to school like back to school as an adult and uh, in my early 30s and uh, um, I had been in a really violent marriage and my uh, and I got I broke up got out of the marriage just the same year like two days um, after I left my husband my mom was diagnosed with uh, cancer and I know that if, if it would have happened two days earlier wouldn't have left, I would have stayed here. But um, because my mom, um, she passed away eight months later. And, uh, she was young, she was only 54. And one of the things that, uh, she didn't tell me, but she told my sister, uh, that she always wished that one of her kids would go be with her son. And, um, and my grandmother used to tell us, go to school, go to school, So when after my mom passed, I, I took one course, and I took two, and then I just went in, I took, went to university. But I went into art, you know, like on the easy road. <laughs> and then I found out I'm really not a very good artist. And, but then I failed this tap English test. You write, you had to write an essay, and I failed it. So um, I, uh, I had to take an English class. And I took this course, I took it from this lady. I don't know if I should say this on film or not. She's from Alberta, this lady. Her name is Aretha Van Kirk. She's a famous writer. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of her name, but I don't know. And I have to say that when my daughter was little, she called her Aretha Van Kirk. Because <laughs> 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 she, she didn't like kids. And, um, but I had her as a teacher my first English class, and she, uh, maybe the second or third class, she made us write an essay. And have you ever seen those booklets that you have to write, write in for school? And, like, that's all they give you. You sit there and you just have this booklet on your desk. you got to write in it, and then they take it and write it in. So we had to write an essay. And um, the lady was, it was a huge class. And she comes back in the class, I don't know, maybe a week or two later. And she has this big pile, because there was like 75 students in there. Big pile of paper, and she slams it on her desk, and she goes, you bunch of idiots. And she looks around the room like that, and she goes, I don't know how you made it through the house. <laughs> and I'm thinking, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paying for this. <laughs> So um, she, um, she said, only two people passed in the whole class. And I get my thing back, and it's got a little recipe card in it with big red writing, and it says, this is no essay, but you sure as hell can write. That's what it said. That's what I said to me. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, well, gee, I never thought anyone would ever say anything like that to me. But I never really thought about it because it was hard for me to accept compliments. And um, plus, I didn't know who she was. I had this, I have dyslexia. I have some other learning disability, so it never occurred to me in my life. I had spell. It never occurred to me in my life that I was ever like. <laughs> but then after um, I, I took that course with her. She said, she said, 
just for like five or five courses. And then I went to study from there. And then I took a creative course, a poetry writing class. And um, I remember that first time in class, and they made it, he made us read our poems out loud. I'm like, what? We have to read them out loud? We don't have to just read those. And I'm sitting there like this, I'm trying to read what I wrote. <laughs> I was so nervous. But, um, I think it's one of the best things that, that ever happened to me. I didn't know it. Um, and my, my auntie, uh, some, like my writing was really autobiographical. It's about myself a lot of times. You know, sometimes people will tell me stories and they say, you should write this, you're a writer, aren't you? You should write this story. I'm like, are you kidding? I got enough, I got enough stories to tell, you know? From my own, from my own world, which is you know how we're taught is we're taught that you taught you tell about yourself, and that's that's how, that's how I was taught. And, and um, it, it keeps you from lots of people. If you summarize and you talk about yourself, um, so that's how I ended up. I believe that would happen, but I'm still doing it. And I love it, you know, it's something that I love. And it, I guess if, if you're here as business people, as entrepreneurs, and um, like, can I just say something I told someone here earlier? Um, what is the name of the company? Well, Alani Subamsuan. Alani Subamsuan. She's a Mohawk filmmaker, and she's in her 80s, isn't it? Yeah. She's been making films since she was a young woman, and she's only made one film about a non-native, and that's about him. And um, I seen this film a few years ago, and because I went to the library, you can get like films are in the library, and uh, and I watched this film about you, and then suddenly last year I met you, and. Um, Professor, um, I call him Monsieur the Professor, <laughs> uh, was uh, fired from McGill University and never told why, ever to this day. And um, the suspicion is it's because it's the way that we teach. I figured it has to be about money. But um, it's in the white world it always is. But, um, Maybe some funders didn't want me to change me. That's what I mean. So um, the fact that you're here and you're doing what you're doing now is probably what you're going to be doing. I call this reality-based education. <coughs> and since we're in dialogue, remember folks, the only wrong question is the unasked. Question. What would you like to ask Ms. Sharon Crew Turner? I think you gave some hints along the way because all everybody in here uh somebody went for myself like a hint, nature and beauty. That's what caught in my eye. Somewhere that makes you do this and that. But you don't just think of something that's there. You must have experienced something where it's like tattooed in your mind or whatever. It's there where you went through a lot. That's just my personal thing to do, is to get the ball rolling. And I think that what she's bringing up applies directly to what you're doing. We can either see our lived experience as a liability that it's going to drag us down, or we can turn that into an asset through creativity and make the best of it. And actually, by giving voice to what we've lived, we can morph into someone we never dreamed of. And we can do what we did not think possible. So we're faced with this challenge. You know, life is a two-edged sword. 
Is this a liability or is this an asset? And she's just said how tough it was, but in the end, it made her who she is and the writer that she has become. Well, here's, here's the same piece of writing and another member of the seminar. I also incidentally asked them to do a tweet on each piece of the writing. To tweet? A tweet about the piece of writing. I've well, never tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's another member of the seminar. One word, symbolic. One sentence, using nature in a symbolic context to describe emotions and thoughts. One paragraph, in using nature to describe her thoughts and feelings, she is able to make a visual connection with her readers, to get a grasp of what she is saying. Her metaphors on nature and seasons blend her emotion and depth of what is being told so that it speaks to the reader. Stream of consciousness. The writing makes me feel like I'm having an overhead or bird's eye view of what I'm reading. So I can see what she wrote instead of just reading it. I'm actually there, living, breathing this story, which is quite weird and awesome at the same time. <laughs> like the feeling of flying or floating above one's conscious thought and getting caught in a vortex of swirling thoughts and emotions that can take you and decipher what this, <coughs> the message that is prominent in your mind. Tweet, here's their tweet on your piece of writing. Ah, the D D D D D. I'm as happy as can be as how I can read this free flying and creative as my mind is to wonder in self thought and expression. <coughs> the title, their title for this piece of writing, fly when you're awake. This is this is the feeling I get from reading it. Although I know this is my own interpretation of the story, it's the name I give to it. My definition. Uh, my uh, portrait of whoever wrote these words. I feel that the people that wrote these words are from the east coast of Canada, are male and female of some <coughs> original descent. I feel that they are an artist and come from a community where poverty and family dysfunction is a common problem. I feel that they are active in the community they have a compassion to let the world know their heart's desire and the empathy they feel. How would you respond to that, uh, Ms. Prue Turner? <coughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really powerful statement. Isn't it amazing, though, how uh, <coughs> you know, like a stream of consciousness and just bring stuff out? There's a lot there. It's a lot to comment on. <laughs> Take your choice. And we'll run with it. Okay. And you can also challenge the person who wrote it if they want to identify themselves, but that's up to them. Okay, if they want to identify I'm like, why would I want to challenge I that? Wrote. You did. <laughs> it's amazing. It, you know what? And even the, um, the depth of your. Uh, What you see, like the depth of your own empathy, that you, that's what you demonstrate there to me, is the depth of your own empathy. And also, um, the way that you, uh, um, and, and I, you know, it's not very many readers actually take the time to, um, I guess you could say, make a portrait of the author, you know what I mean? And um, as more than just a photograph or just a name, and and um, and you, like I cannot tell you how bang on you are <laughs> in, in your in your interpretation. So, um, like 
Like I could just, everything that you wrote, I could just say, uh-huh, and blah, 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 <laughs> you know, each thing that you wrote there. So, um, just thank you for being such a careful reader. Well, that's what I took out of it when I read it. In the first sentence there, when I read it, that's, that's what it gave me, was a bird's eye view of everything you were saying. And just, it's weird that you had titled that, uh, Yes, exactly, because you didn't know that. Hey, I'm looking out the window of a plane, and I was really sitting on the plane, and I had a dream, and I, I didn't remember the dream, but I woke myself up because I was laughing out loud. <laughs> Not the thing to do when you're sitting on a plane. <laughs> and, um, uh, but I, I, I grew up in the Ottawa Valley, which is uh, in Ontario. It, it's a huge river that flows out into the St. Lawrence Seaweed. And my family's from all down there, the, the, the coast of, of Quebec there, and then into Ontario and up the Ottawa River. And it's the, where I grew up, the, the river, the Ottawa River, was so wide that it looks like a lake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, I did not know that that wasn't just not an ordinary river. So when I moved to Alberta, I'm asking around, so where's the rivers around here? <laughs> People are like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, there's a stream over there, but I haven't seen the rivers yet. And they're like, oh, that's a river. <laughs> it's the Bow River. So um, I, uh, like, really, you couldn't even really see the land on the other side. It's just like a fuzzy, you know, blue stuff. And um, it's a powerful body of water. And it's forested, so I kind of grew up in, in the bush. I'd never been in a restaurant until I was 19, you know? And um, um, so then, when I moved to Alberta, uh, where I live now in, in the Calgary area, I live in Calgary. And I'm originally, I'm part Algonquin, which is black. Blackfoots are all on them. They might be there. there. And um, so I'm, the land is so different. I can't even imagine how the people migrated there and then made that land their land. They had no choice. They could have been They had choices. They could have been They chose to stay there and become like, Algonquins are farming people, but the black people aren't farming people. So they changed everything about themselves. And um, became buffalo people and had that whole identity around the buffalo. And um, so it just shows how resilient our people are. And when I was flying over and I was in the, and looking down like that, because I've been doing a lot of flying since I've been writing, and I never flew before, right? I have this theory that when you're flying... Oh, my name's John. <laughs> but I have this theory, you know, when you're flying, you're going really fast, going like 500 miles an hour or something. You know, like, you know how in Star Trek they say, if you go to the speed of time, you never eat. <laughs> so I have this theory that flying we should live on that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I never knew that I would end up in you know, all that fun. But it's really a being way up there is something you see so much. So thank you for Well, uh, there's a few principles for entrepreneurship that come out here. And and he just told you his first name. He didn't tell you his last name. His last name is Saddleback. Make sure you never say Saddlebags. <laughs> <laughs> and two principles here for entrepreneurship. First is, folks, trust yourselves. We I've just read two people, two different people in Change It Up, both who have written in a way that has impacted the poet, the author, the writer of these words. And this is all done 
intuitively. This is done on the spot. This is, they're going with their gut. Folks, trust yourselves. Have confidence in yourselves. Because it works. You're right. I mean, we're born to trust ourselves, right? Immediately. But then we <clears> learn <throat> not to. So, it's relearning. Boy, I'd trust myself if I was you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Have any I of bet you... to all the rest of you, too. Well, hopefully we're going to get to... Oh, yeah, yeah, pardon me. Good idea. Can I see Mr. Saddleback? <laughs> <laughs> Um, any of you ever hear, see a film called Dead Poets Society? Yeah. You know, who's seen it? Well, there's a, you know at the beginning of the film, The Dead Poets Society, there's this guy who's scared stiff. Now the actor's name is Ethan Hawke. I love his last name. I wish I had a name like that. And he is so scared. There's an expression that one uses in English, but I won't use it. It begins with... S and S with S. <laughs> um, and the, the teacher tells him, okay, come on up front here, like these uh, game shows, come on down. He has him come on down, and he's scared to death to read his poem. And because of the fear factor, the teacher tells him, just close your eyes and just let it flow out of your mouth. Do you remember that scene? And he's going round and round and he's just speaking. And everybody can't believe what's coming out of his mouth. Spontaneously, instantly, just out, but, you know, out of his gut like that. And they are stunned. And then the teacher looks at him straight in the eye. When everybody realizes the riches that this person had inside and it never said because they were always too scared, too silent, says, don't you ever forget it. That moment when they discovered the abilities they had, that's what I would say to you. Don't you ever forget what you've written because you've got it. Now, the only wrong question is the unasked question. And our time will go very fast today, folks. Who would like to ask a question? You've got the writer here. Uh, question. Yes, come here, Ms. Rattlesnake. Sorry, I'm getting restless. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I have a question for you. Do you ever iron poetry too? And I, I realized that at first I started writing it because I liked it. A circle is inclusive, and we have a member of the seminar who's not in the circle. Please bring your chair, Ms. Twins. Join the circle. We want to include you. So we made, we, we created a space for you here, Ms. Twins. We're just waiting for you. Well, here's the same piece of writing, another member of the seminar. Um, their tweet about this. their tweet about what you wrote? Tweet. I feel like a melody floating in the current of a breeze. If I allow myself to trust my gut instinct, I won't be led astray. <coughs> their title? Being the Nature Walk. I am one with Grandmother, Moon, and Mother Earth. 
Now they invented a word, which I'm going to show to you. Trachinery. And trachinery means talking directly to nature. Incidentally, language is an invention of human beings, so it's perfectly valid to invent your own words and their meaning. And then the portrait of who wrote this, having never met you, or not knowing your name or anything. Portrait of whoever wrote all these words. Female, Métis, long, beautiful hair, usually braided, talks to herself a lot. <laughs> Analytical, reflective, listens to her gut instinct, is one with nature, has an affinity for Mother Earth, natural, thinks outside the box, hidden pain, smiles even if it hurts. Doesn't drink or abuse drugs, in parentheses, anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Open-minded, accepting, empathetic, traditional. Wears skirts and dresses, expresses her native heritage through dress, goes to ceremony, sweats, explores. So how would you respond to that? <laughs> so, that's so neat. So this person said completely different things about me, about the writer. Because, and you've asked people to write about the writer, right? This, at the very end, after they have read so many of your poems, now I ask them to give me a, a mental picture, how they saw the, the, the writer. And I never said poet. I just said, whoever wrote these words, would you describe them? And I, I think that's that's really a neat thing to do too because um, it just reminds me of what first of all what you were saying about words coming out when you read them. You go, what the heck, right? <laughs> and um, I had written this story uh, recently for this lean, and I don't usually write story stories. And it's about Ruguru. You know Ruguru? Anybody know Ruguru? kind of like a, a werewolf, and uh, Métis write tell those stories, and a lot of the Norman Greeks tell those stories. And um, so I had written this story, and in the last part, and I had given it to the woman, right? And then uh, she told, she got back and said, yeah, I want the story, so um, then I go in and I'm going to rewrite it again. And um, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, what the heck? Like, I was reading this, this woman accepted this, I don't even know what it says. <laughs> but I guess she got something out of it, you know, which was really neat and interesting. Um, but I guess what, what I was going to say was, usually, um, like that lady that I sent the story to, she actually asked me, um, she talked about the woman in the story as if it was me. Right? And the woman in the story wasn't me. <laughs> and um, but what you've done is you've asked them to ask actually ask them to write about me, not the you know, like kind of like um, which I found I find that really um, refreshing. But anyways, um, I also think that whoever this person is, is also really, really perceptive. Um, except I never was really into drugs and alcohol. <laughs> uh, my That's what Clint, Clinton said when he was president, too. Remember? He, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he the, smoked, but never inhaled. <laughs> <laughs> I smoked, but I inhaled. And, um, but my, because my, my, there was so much alcoholism in my family and so much violence, when I was 15, I just like made you know one of those 15-year-old moments of like 
I am not going to be like my parents. I am not going to drink. I am not going to drug it. I am not going to be violent. And um, and I didn't. And um, and and that's not to say that I've never had a drink in my life, but I never throw up after two years. So, but I never um, went that road. And uh, I wasn't violent with my kids at all. <coughs> that it definitely made uh, them have a better experience of their lives. Like, I'm not saying I'm, I'm a perfect parent, so I'm nowhere near that, but I know I can see it in my kids, I can see it in my grandkids. They're different. They're, they're, they're happier. They're, they have a better life. And, um, and also, by making that decision for myself, it meant that um, so much guilt that I don't have. Dark. You know, I was white by the time I was 30. Mm. Mm. Surprised that I could be. My little granddaughter, she says, Hey, you know, she says, See that lady in that picture? So when I was young, I called my baby, her mom, she goes, That's you. <laughs> <laughs> One of the writers that I've had the privilege of working with was a guest and came in just like we're doing right now. And she said something I will never forget about what creativity is. And we've been talking about creativity all last week. Creativity, 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 and what role will it play in business and entrepreneurship? And I invite you to think about what this writer said, their definition of creativity. Creativity is finding out what you know, but you don't know that you know it. And what we do here is we take the time to find out what we know, but we don't know we know it until we reflect on it. Something else has come out. You might have noticed empathy, empathetic, now that may sound very psychological and therapeutic, but it's also a business principle, folks. If you're going to make it in your business and your entrepreneurship, you've got to project empathy. You've got to be able to put yourself into your customers' shoes, moccasins, boots. You've got to be able to see what's important to them in them. And that's what you've been doing here. And I really encourage you to, when you go into your businesses, to project empathy. Part of it is by listening very well, but letting them know that you're aware of what matters to them. And you're seeking to meet those, what psychologists call, felt needs. Marketing, folks, is all about psychology. Meeting felt needs. That's where empathy comes in. You, being able to put yourself in your customer's place. And that's what you did in your writing. Questions? The only wrong question is the unasked question. Was it You're raising your oh, Go ahead. Was it your intention or did you intend for like, uh, the, the rooted sadness and uh, the dysfunction in your life to come on your work? 
That's a very good question. Or is it just something that happened along the lines when you were writing? Yeah, I think I, it's a real hard question to answer because it's not intentional, but it's there, right? It's like, like you read that, you saw that when you were reading. And um, my, um, like if I was to say I had a vision, it would be something better for you know, all other people. And um, it would be something really good. to get there we gotta really like we gotta we have to talk we have to like spit out all the stuff that's happening to us for 500 years of you know just horrible shit right? and um uh, so it was at first it was really hard for me to actually like put my writing out there because it's personal. And I mean who cares? Who cares about me? You know? And um and I went to my an auntie of mine and I was talking to her about it and she told me, um, she says, it's your duty. It's your duty to share that, she said. She says, you know, not all of us have that ability. Mm -hmm. Creator gives us all gifts. And I'm sorry. But you know, you can write, so suck it up. And she said, it's your duty to share it. Because she says, I don't know if you've ever noticed sometimes when you're reading, and it's true, sometimes when I'm reading, I think, gee, I wish I could have said that. That says what I think even better than I could ever think of. Or say it. You know? Like you said that when you said creativity is finding out. Finding out that you don't know what you already know. Finding out what you know, but you don't know that you know. Right. You know. So, <laughs> so I can't hide what's there, right? It's going to come out. And she told me, it's got to come out. Let it come out. And that gets back to the question, is it a liability or is it an asset? And do you build on, believe it or not, by building on the pain, the hurt, the past, something very good has come out of this. Something necessary <coughs> and something that's clearly communicating and reaching others. Other questions, comments, observations? I think that's true that it is like your duty to write because you have that gift. It's really important to um, to get it like mass published too because so many people in the world feel the same way. And it's important for them to know that someone else feels that. Mm -hmm. I was able to make my world slow motion just because of, you know, you get gifts from, from hard things and I think that's one of the things I got is I have the ability to just do that. Everything can go in slow motion. They can last a lot longer. And um, so uh, then I guess you see the world in a different way, you know, and then being able to see the world I spent a lot of time on the land because I had to just to stay the same. And I grew up in such a beautiful place. And I live in a beautiful place now. And this is a beautiful place. <laughs> I spent a lot of time up at Kikiwan when my brother took it. But I wanted to comment on the red skirt, or the, I mean, the, the skirt thing. I don't know who wrote that, but. I did. You do? It's so funny because, um, um, you know, my granddaughter I was talking about, number one, 
went to a wedding last year, and um, I took her to this, this young people's wedding, and they're, they're standing up there, and she says, hey, she says, don't they have any kids? I said, no, I don't think they have any kids. She goes, well, how do they know if they're right from one another? <laughs> <laughs> The Scottish, they were killed. Yeah. You happen to be there, and I said, I dare you to see what's under, I'll buy you your dinner. I said, I just kept thinking, sure, that I said, I said, go for it. I don't know. <laughs> no, just kidding. Traditionally, they don't wear nothing under those. I don't know, I didn't want to. Get a big surprise, you got under there. <laughs> well, we had, we had a comment from Ms. Rattlesnake to you, but yeah, I don't think you got to hear it. I did. Ms. Lee had her hand up, too. I was just uh, going to say, ask you, did you, uh, do you call your grand no poem, too? Because that's what we do. Like, my mom calls my son, and my son, and when they were, my nieces, when they were little, Do that. You could call her your local too, because she's your teacher too. Yes. And we're learning that right now. I just yeah. Hearing. Yeah, I do that too with my, my little my little grandson. He's he's just two and I'm saying, Hey Mosha. <laughs> he always you know he comes he answers to that and he knows who he is. Yeah, we call them grandma and grandpa. So you guys are you guys speak Cree? No, but my um because I'm here, it's 
seems like I live in black hole country, but I can know what the green is. So I've kind of learned some of the you know language and stuff. And my my son-in-law is um, he's Soto, but his mom speaks Cree. So um, she's from Saskatchewan, and um, it just it's I've just been around it so much. That, you know, they call me, you know, from the of Grandma in Ojibwe. Uh, We've got some strong Ojibwe. I what we say too. Yeah, I knew that. So yeah, so um, that's how that goes. And P.S. in ceremony, I wear a blanket. I do want to compromise. Oh, well, that's something like I I want to um, start a line of clothing. Like, Based, and that's one thing that I want to make because a lot of women don't like to wear skirts. I would just like to like you know, make some wraparound that they can feel over yeah. there. Yeah. 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 yeah, some sort of surround style. I should mention that Ms. Prue Turner is just she got home and you know when we talk about making sure we deliver the goods, she was in Montana and got home to Calgary half past midnight yesterday and then got on the got on the uh, on the highway to be here but she is often participates in ceremony I mean like I I, I almost feel like you have to book her between ceremonies uh, and that's really what's happened uh, you were involved in down in Montana uh, what was taking place there this weekend Okay. But um, it's just a part of my life. Yeah. I've been asked to be, I'm getting older now, so I just have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, well, we'll move to someone else in the seminar. Um, they invented uh, their own word after reading your, and I'll, I'll write it down for you. they invented is, well, did I write it correctly? No, I didn't. Blang, Blang der Housing. Blang der Housing. This is my word, and it means that this is my world, and I'm taking it by storm. <laughs> <laughs> Blang der Housing. Now, their portrait of whoever wrote all these poems, these women have great minds. Due to the fact that may, they made me delve into my inner self. I see them as visionaries whose souls are deep with great imaginations. Makes me think that they are native, maybe Métis, with a deep culture in their blood. And the material world is not such a big thing in their lives. They're family-oriented, but at the same time, successful in their own perspective and don't have to care what people think of them. Is that true? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's different from all the others, but it's also true. Yeah, I didn't know I was such a well-rounded person. <laughs> <laughs> What it does bring out that is every one of us is multi-dimensional. And really what's happened is you've got 15 different perspectives that each of them are drawing on your multi-dimensionality. And that's true of each of us. If we could develop the many facets of ourselves, it'll make us better entrepreneurs, better business people. Well, here's... Um, well, we should open up, up for questions because we're going to take a break real soon, folks. Let's uh, get in uh, some questions here. You said you broke into the writing. Give me a book first published on forty. Pardon? You said give me a writing first published. You said what? Forty? So. Yeah, I was forty. Was forty-two. Forty-two. 
So do you know your background of being a lady? Was it more difficult to get published? No. No, no I never, I never, independent well, publishing? no, uh, I went to, uh, my first book was a, about, like it was a memoir, so that's like about, it was not poetry at all, and uh, it was about part of my childhood, and it was actually my best selling book, what is it called? It's called Where the Rivers Join. And it's written under a pseudonym, like if not my name, they wouldn't let me use my own name, but they went out of business a year later. It's the biggest check I ever got. And then with the history of museum, I could connect with the older people, and then maybe bridge gap that, that is a meeting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I've been doing this for 10 years, so I've been, it's like a mobile spa. Mobile spa? Yeah. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> nice. Can you say a little bit more about your mobile spa? Um, I started after high school. I was doing programs for this racist program and for healthy families. Um, then after that, I just started going into the baby ones like the wedding schedule. Um, I, my dream is to have a salon here. Um, I worked in town, and there's there's not one here, so might as well take advantage of it. Um, we're business partners. Um, we've had a few ideas, but it's breaking it down now that we're farther into the program and whatnot, we're starting to see that there's a lot of potential and a lot of different things that we could do, and they still are based around all of our ideas. We're just now down to deciding what we think is going to work best. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do and provide was like my dad's wife runs the Roots of Empathy in the schools and whatnot. And uh, I wanted to work with like the younger girls and the younger children when it comes to extracurricular activities or keeping the environment clean and um, like cleanliness. That was just one of the ideas. So that would have had fallen into um, like house cleaning, so cleanliness. Um, whether that means like preparing meals for elders and whatnot, people who need the help, um, yard maintenance and cleaning, house repairs, interior design, and stuff like that, along with a secondhand store to make it more feasible for everybody who doesn't have stuff like washers and dryers and whatnot, or the money or affordable food. Exciting. It's a lot. I see it all as one bunch, though. I can see it. I can see it all in one little pot, out of the same office space, mm. just subbed out. Is that the what you said? <laughs> He's just got the bigger end of the picture to it. Very much on motive. It's all driving towards that, but. Getting these two started up first would help go towards that dream in the long run. But for the basic needs, yeah, that'd be the thing to that I'd want to go with. It's basically a low income community, so having that second store would go a long ways for most people. Instead of traveling to Canada's already or any place to go for a new store, you can come. I, I has always been intrigued by meeting those who run junkyards. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize that they're some of the richest people. And I found out why, because I, I actually knew a young lady who, her father, that was his business. They get everything free, they pay nothing, or next to nothing, and sometimes they actually get paid for going to get it and getting off somebody's uh, property. 
and they, everything they sell is a thousand percent profit because they paid nothing and they can get the going rate. I mean, junkyards are the business to go into. They really work. And some of the wealthiest people in Eastern Canada, that's how they started. What I'd like to add to that, if you're a native, it just becomes wordy. He's <laughs> 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 got, got a great sense of <laughs> a, junkyard, a junkyard is just a place, they'll normally just have a little wall around it, there'll be a lot of derelict cars, there'll be old machines, washing machines and stuff, and when people need a part, what they do is they go to the junkyard, and because they don't need the whole motor. They just need a valve, or they need a bearing, or they need something like that. Well, since you got that for nothing or next to nothing, you sell it to them. It's still a reasonable price, but because you paid nothing for it, you're, you can make easily a thousand percent profit just by selling that missing part, that missing link they need. And I was astonished at some of the wealthiest people I met were in junkyards. Well, I'm Clinton, uh, with my wife Andy, we're, we're partners as well, and uh, my idea of uh, what we're getting to do is uh, want to be a craftsperson that sells outfits and stuff like that, with parts of uh, regalia for Apollos, and, uh, but I only want us to do that, I want to sell the, the crafts that people need to make their own with such and in a big picture scale, I want to be a supplier to the movie companies and all these uh, shows and stuff for original, um, traditional wear that they use in the movies that doesn't do it. Yeah, exactly. So I want to make it more important. But that's my perspective of it. But, I mean, <coughs> yeah, more ideas. I'm Norman. Um, I'm a successful entrepreneur. I have been in my business since 2000. I've been in computer sales and fairs. Uh, I've been uh, donating to children since since I opened. Well, actually, since uh, August 1st, 2012. Donated for the six computer sales. Um, my goal is to open up a, a few chain of stores, mostly on the reserves, surrounding areas, to help the low income people out there. Uh, so, um, 
used in papers or low price papers. Parts you can get away with uh, used parts, uh, but it depends where they have you know, their money situation is, I guess. So I feel there's a demand for that. Fixing vehicles up, supplying the parts, and whatever it needs. Hello, my name's John. My business idea is. Uh, what I want to get out of it is to train either my family or whoever wants to come into my business and train in certain areas, like whether it be welding, you know, helping me put together go-karts, help design go-kart tracks, and whether it be in the management department. You know, I'd like to see different people doing different jobs within my business where I can send them for training and they can come back and help me in my business. Like it's not only for me, it's basically for everybody else. And that's one of my goals. Well, we'll leave you, Ms. Prue-Turner, and the members of the uh, seminar before we go on our break with one last word that one of them invented. And it seems quite appropriate in view of what we've just heard. They invented the word life full. Life and their definition of it, life is unique and full of surprises, so always be lifeful. <laughs> well, folks, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Please keep it to 10, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes.